Hey guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we will be talking about the gastric polyps. So let's get started. So what are gastric polyps? Gastric polyps are small growths or masses which occur on the inner lining of the stomach. They are a common incidental find on the upper GI endoscopy and there are many different types of these polyps, some of which cause no disturbance at all while others have the potential to cause a serious malignancy. So you can see here in the picture on the right, we have the small growth which has occurred in the inner lining of the stomach. And this is basically what a gastric polyp is. And from the description, we noted that some of them actually are benign and they cause no problem whatsoever. They have no symptoms associated with them, while others will go on to cause some serious problems and can even become cancerous. So let's talk a little bit more about them. So what are the types of gastric polyps? There are a few main types of gastric polyps and they are the hyperplastic polyps, the fundic gland polyps, the gastric adenomatous polyps, and the gastric neuroendocrine polyps or the carcinoids. So first let's talk about the fundic gland polyps. The fundic gland polyps are one of the most common polyps found in the stomach and account for about 47% of all polyps. So these group of polyps are the most found, almost 50% of them, 47% to be exact. And these polyps come in three distinct clinical contexts, which are the sporadic polyps, so they occur sporadically, polyps associated with proton pump inhibitor usage, so people who take proton pump inhibitors for many other diseases, such as GERD or gastritis, or any other association with proton pump inhibitor usage. They can also be associated with syndromic polyps, and this is mainly in people who suffer from familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP syndrome. Um, the sporadic fundic gland polyps are sessile polyps located in the body or the fundus. So if you can see on my diagram below, this is the body of the stomach, and this upper portion is called a fundus. So these fundic gland polyps, hence the name fundic gland polyps, are mostly found in the fundus of the stomach, which is here, or the body. The fundic gland polyps are usually asymptomatic and are discovered incidentally on endoscopy. Only in rare cases can they reach a size large enough to cause an obstruction or symptoms of abdominal pain or vomiting. So these polyps don't really cause that much of a nuisance at all. They are benign and they are found in many people and uh, they don't really cause many symptoms associated with them. More about the fundic gland polyps, uh, they are typically small, 0.1 to 0.8 centimeters, so even less than a centimeter. They are hyperemic and sessile and have a smooth surface contour. The risk of dysplasia in these polyps is almost negligible with a less than 1% chance of malignancy. So even though they account for the most common found polyps, they are actually benign and just less than 1% of them uh, have a chance of malignancy. Fundic gland polyps, which are more than a centimeter in diameter, or polyps that are ulcerated or located in the antrum, should be resected to confirm the diagnosis and rule out dysplasia or neoplasia. So only if they are more than a centimeter will we have some alarming symptoms and usually we just reject them, so they are surgically removed. So now let's talk about the hyperplastic polyps. The hyperplastic polyps are the second most common gastric polyp, and they account for about 75% of gastric polyps in areas where H. pylori infections are common. So these polyps are associated with Helicobacter pylori. Hyperplastic polyps are usually sessile or pedunculated and are usually less than 2 cm in diameter and typically occur in the antrum. So this is the pyloric antrum, which is in purple in color. And you can see this is where most of these uh, hyperplastic polyps occur. Interestingly, these polyps themselves have little neoplastic potential, but they are associated with an increased risk of synchronous cancer elsewhere in the gastric mucosa, particularly associated with chronic gastritis. So because this type of polyp has the association with Helicobacter pylori, and because Helicobacter pylori causes ulcers and gastritis, you can tie in the connections there. Because in Helicobacter pylori we have this chronic inflammation and infection of the gastric mucosa, 
uh, that in turn has malignant potential. But usually the hyperplastic polyps themselves are not the cause of cancer in this case. Malignancy develops in hyperplastic polyps through dysplasia in 1 to 20 percent of hyperplastic polyps. So they do have a risk which is 1 to 20 percent of being uh, malignant and the risk of malignancy in hyperplastic polyps is increased in polyps which are more than one centimeter and pedunculated in shape. More about the hyperplastic polyps, the eradication of the H. pylori infection will result in the regression of hyperplastic polyps in about 70% of patients and hyperplastic polyps measuring more than 0.5 centimeters should be resected completely and in addition the normal appearing antral and corpus mucosa should be sampled to assess the presence of dysplasia and H. pylori. And all patients with H. pylori should be treated with H. pylori eradication therapy. So I did do a video on H. pylori if you guys are interested in knowing what the eradication therapy consists of or more about the H. pylori infection and the associated symptoms, you can pop over to that video and give that video a watch. I'll put a link in the description for that video. So now let's talk about the gastric adenomatous polyps. So the gastric adenomatous polyps are the most common gastric neoplastic polyp. So this is the most cancerous type of polyp. The gastric adenomas account for 6 to 10 percent of all gastric polyps. So they're not very common in the gastric polyp family, but they do account for 6 to 10 percent and have the most malignant potential. They typically occur in a background of chronic atrophic gastritis. So these patients usually have this chronic episodes of atrophic gastritis. Sporadic gastric adenomatous polyps may be viewed as one of the possible steps in the development of the gastric adenocarcinoma. Adenomas may be flat or polypoid and are usually less than 2 cm in size and are usually solitary. Gastric adenomas are neoplastic and consists of dysplastic columnar cells with striated borders and it is estimated that 8 to 59 percent of adenomas are associated with synchronous gastric carcinomas. So these kind of polyps are actually very interesting because they have the highest possibility of being malignant. So this is quite an alarming polyp to, to have. And it's quite alarming for the patient as well. So if you do test this polyp and you do find out that it's a gastric adenomatous polyp, the best thing to do is to reject it as soon as possible. So more about them is the management given the increased risk of gastric cancer all gastric adenomas should be resected. This can usually be accomplished endoscopically, but on occasion, surgery may be required for lesions that contain invasive carcinoma or in patients with multiple adenomas. So now we're going to talk about the gastric neuroendocrine polyps or the carcinoids. The gastric neuroendocrine tumors are derived or made up of endocrine cells. They are subdivided into three types as they have different etiologies, biological behavior, and prognoses. So type 1 of the tumors represent 70-80% to 80 of all gastric neuroendocrine tumors and are associated with prolonged hypergastrinemia, typically resulting from autoimmune atrophic gastritis. Type 2 of these tumors account for 5-8% to 8 of gastric neuroendocrine tumors and result from prolonged hypergastrinemia from a gastrin secreting tumor. So these are typical in patients who have Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. I did do a video on that, so if you guys are more interested, you can check that out. And in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, these patients suffer from a gastrin secreting tumor, which increases the acidity in the stomach and so on. So this mechanism is common in patients who also suffer from gastric neuroendocrine polyps. Type three, of the neuroendocrine tumors are sporadic and account for about 20% of all the gastric neuroendocrine tumors. Type 1 and type 2 tumors usually have an indolent course. Type 3 is the most aggressive and local or hepatic metastasis are present in up to 65% of patients who undergo resection. So these are very aggressive and they even have this tendency to invade the local structures with even hepatic metastasis. For type 1 and type 2 gastric carcinoids, smaller than 1 to 2 centimeters, endoscopic resection is the treatment of choice. In patients with multiple progressive tumors, anterectomy should be considered to remove the gastrin stimulus. And in type 3 or the sporadic gastric carcinoids, 
they are treated by partial or total gastrectomy with local lymph node resection. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this video very informative. Please do like, comment, subscribe and share. And if you would like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.